All right, welcome to the uh, class tonight. We are picking up in our study of Romans, chapters six, uh, 5 through 8. We've been in chapter 6. We're at the end of chapter 6 for uh, a couple of classes now. And in our last class, we were talking about our the, the enslavement. Well, in the last couple of classes, we were talking about the enslavement of the soul. And... I think in the last class we dealt with an order uh, with some of the things that Paul says in his letters and how he presents to the believer um, the absolute certainty of a state of being. How in Christ we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings. In Christ we have we are now those who are filled with all the fullness of God, being complete in Him. How God has summarized all things in one, and that one in whom He has summarized all things is now made unto us all spiritual things. And upon the heels, or upon that basis, He always, in His letters, at the first of most of His letters, but throughout His letters, he presents the necessity of the soul to see, to comprehend, to come to the recognition of what God has bestowed in grace. But he does not do so as a means to attain. He does it as the beholding of what God hath already wrought and bestowed in its absolute fullness to the soul that is born of his seed. And that's what these chapters in Romans are discussing. It's discussing a state of absolute death and sin in one man and absolute fullness and perfection and righteousness in another. No gray areas. No room for any, any uh, room for uh, mixture. It's either one or the other, death or life, flesh or spirit, darkness or light. And these two men that he is presenting in these chapters set forth that distinction. And he makes that distinction in many of his letters. In, in, in fruit, works of the flesh, fruit of the spirit, which we'll discuss tonight some. Because we're going to be talking about fruit here in these verses at the end of chapter 6. And then in chapter 7, we'll get into a man attempting to bear the fruit of God without having the life in which that fruit is present. Because many people present fruit as the result of deeds done and observations of, of religion and zeal. Fruit is the very reality of a life that is present. Fruit is not developed. The fruit of God is given in a life. The fruit of God is the presence of a person who is the very fruit of the Spirit himself. The fruitful branch. The vine. The seed. In that life, everything of spiritual fullness resides. And if that seed is in you, if that life is in you, if he is your life, then all spiritual fullness is now present and accounted for within you. And so Paul presenting that in, in, in his letters presents how great our salvation truly is, how perfect our state of being is because he who is in us is the determining factor of our state of being, the determining factor of our relationship with God. And having presented such a beautiful picture, he now says, now by prayer for you, my desire for you, the necessity now is for you to know, for your eyes to be opened, for the soul to be unveiled to the perfect and present life that is in you. That in such you will know what God has already known. 
and you'll come to know even as you are known of God. And there will not be a conflict between your pursuing a knowledge of based upon self-examination and the knowledge of God that is always based upon reality or is reality. So we're going to get into these last verses of chapter 6 tonight and um, point out a couple of things. I won't keep you long tonight, but some things that are important as we proceed into, into chapter uh, 7. And uh, <coughs> We're going to start in verse 20 just to get the verses we've already touched. Just get that in there. For when you were the servants or slaves of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? See, now he's bringing in fruit. What is the fruit? What is the result of those things? You are now ashamed of, for the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and becoming slaves to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. The word through is actually the word in there. So what we're talking about, we, we've dealt with this before, is that the, this being free from sin or being free from righteousness, being slaves to sin, being slaves to righteousness, all of those things are not results of what we do. It's not the result of you know, eliminating bad habits and picking up good habits, being a better person without, you know, or, or not. That has nothing to do with this. This is not a state that's achieved by deeds done or observations. This is a state that is procured and determined by where you are or in whom you dwell or who lives in you. The seed of which you are born. That is determining, that determines this being made free from sin. Being made free from sin means you are in the one who is dead indeed unto sin, as he's already described here in chapter 6. You are born of the seed, or you are indwelt by the life that is dead indeed unto sin and alive unto God. Therefore, if that is your state, then you are free from sin. We do not have this constant struggle to try to become free from sin, trying to eliminate the sinfulness of our flesh, trying to eliminate the sin and get rid of the bad and bring in the good. And God continually having to fight a fight of getting rid of all the stuff that's not Christ in us. See, that's a constant struggle of people who, who think that their relationship with God is determined by what they see in a mirror, by activities of flesh. And it's not determined there at all. Remember, we've said it's either one man or another. It's either death or life. There are no gray areas in this. The fact is that you have a life that is perfect you have a relationship with God that is perfect. You have a salvation that is complete. You are dead indeed unto sin and alive unto God. Now there must be an inward recognition of such. How do you do that? The recognition comes beholding the one whose state that is and who is made unto you that reality. The one who lives unto God, perfect, unblemished, without fault. That secures your state. But the way you enjoy such a secure state is to see that one. As long as you're beholding yourself and attempting to determine spiritual certainty in the face 
of the variableness of flesh and blood, you will never see the reality. You'll always think there's something more. There's either something of me that has to be eliminated or something of him that needs to be achieved or acquired. The fact is, we have come to a finished work. The old things are passed away and the new has come and all things are of God. And the necessity now is to behold the one who is our life. Because in that one who is our life, all things have been fully given. Fully bestowed. These are not things that you can diminish because of bad deeds or accentuate because of good deeds. I know this is hard for us. Again, with our transactional thoughts toward or concerning our salvation where we do this and God assesses what we do and then makes his determination with regard to our state of being or our relationship with him based upon that. God doesn't assess that way. God beholds one. And that one is either in you or he is not. And if he is in you, then who he is determines all things. Now come and see this man. Come and know the life that he is. So we're going to talk about, we've been talking about a lot of that. And in the verses 22 and 23 especially, I think we're seeing a a very similar contrast, the exact contrast actually, that we see in Galatians chapter 5. And we're going to talk about that. Here we see the terms wages and gift contrasted here, where in Galatians 5 we see the works and fruit contrasted. And it's, it's also important to note that these two uh, merge in many different ways in these verses. Now, when we look at these things, we also have to understand when we're, in, when we're discussing what God has bestowed in his son to the soul. We're discussing the completeness and the salvation of our soul being full and complete and perfect, missing nothing, lacking, wanting nothing. We also have to talk about the concept of waiting on the Lord, patience unto the coming of the Lord. Those are ways that it's said in the scripture, be therefore patient unto the coming of the Lord. And we may read some of those verses too. And the reason I say that is because many people hear those things and they hear patience and they hear waiting. And they think what we're patient for and what we're waiting for is something more to come. And they believe that the, the, what we call the revelation of Jesus Christ is nothing really different than what the world calls a rapture, a second coming. Because that's when we've been told that the good stuff comes. That's when reality comes. That's when fulfillment, consummation, completeness happens. That's not what we're talking about. But for so many, there is a futurism tied up with even an inward salvation, even a salvation that we say Christ is in you. There's still this futurism that comes into the picture when we say, well, Yeah, but we must see him. We must know him. We must wait on his appearing. We must be patient unto his appearing. And we and many hear that and they think, yes, it's just what we've done is dispensationalize the person. And I want you to understand the person cannot be divided. We're not dealing with pieces and parts. We're not dealing with aspects of a person we're dealing with a person a complete person a man in all of his fullness living in your soul 
We're not talking about pieces and parts here. Uh, there's a, always this compulsion to draw upon a false concept of futurism as our point of reference. Even when we're talking about something inward. Why? Because just like those who are looking for something external in the future because they do not yet see it outward with their natural eye, Many who present a Christ who is in you still believe there has to be some outward evidence to say it is so. And if they do not see that outward evidence in others or themselves, inward, individually or corporately, they believe there is still something more, still something yet to be. And this not yet concept in Christianity even with those who are saying Christ is in them, has disenfranchised many in the church. And so we have basically nothing more than a speculative conclusion with regard to our salvation. We speculate on what it's going to look like. How does it look? What does it look like when fullness comes? What does it look like when perfect righteousness comes? Well, it looks like the same one it's always looked like. It looks like him. The issue is you can't see him with natural eyes. You can't know him with a natural mind. And therein comes the necessity of waiting. Because the righteousness that many have been taught to seek is not righteousness at all. It is a cheap, earthbound, man-invented substitute that has man as its reference point, man as its source, and man as its evidence. The righteousness of God, however, is of such a nature that it has to be revealed. It has to be revealed of God himself. He must show the soul the gift that he has bestowed to the soul. Or else we will seek after the cheap Imitation. We will, cheap, we, we, will, we will seek after a false concept. We will build the idols that give a, sub, uh, 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 a seemingly legitimate form to the divine reality that we're seeking after. And religion is built on that. Religion is based upon man giving God his own image giving God his imagination, his concept, his own form. We've created a God in our image. And we've called it righteousness, holiness, and spiritual, and life, and glory, and fullness. And yet there are those who still know that's not fullness and think one day it'll come. Or one day God will make it so in us. God has made it so in us because his son is in us. So this unfortunate futurism that's made it into the church and in the most, while still being convinced of the certainty of Christ within, many who are in that still live with a sense of unfulfillment as to substance and evidence. So almost as I've read in some commentaries that the terms in Christ or Christ in you are merely symbolic phrases, metaphorical. They're not real. So we leave unfulfilled as to the evidence of certain aspects of spiritual life. So while Christ is in us, there's still many particular elements of Christ and his nature that we still believe we must attain or we still believe we must ultimately become the observable evidence of. And it also still perpetuates the continual processes that we believe God has with us achieving aspects of Christ. Ridding ourselves of Adam, getting more of Christ is taught as if Christ is given in a piecemeal manner. 
So waiting for these things in the light of this is ultimately no different than what most of the church believes. And you can say, well, one's inward and one's outward. Well, that still misses the whole point. Still misses the whole point because both of those concepts, whether inward or outward, and we could get very specific, but I won't. I, won't, I don't want to get very specific right now. But both of those things, inward or outward, futurism, still anticipate something or some things, multiple things, that is not already sufficiently bestowed in and as the person of Jesus Christ. We still await something that is devoid or divorced from him. That is other than who he is already. So we continually cast into the realm of future, whether it's an inward thing or an outward thing, the culmination, the reality that culminates this. When there is actually nothing more to come, there is nothing necessary to a soul in which Christ lives except the God-given realization, recognition of what is already at all points sufficient and present because he's there. Now, <clears throat> we, we dealt with some of those things. We dealt with how Paul presents this and the need for patience. But see, another situation is because of this, we see... that so much emphasis is put upon the experience or the comprehension. Well, I want you to understand there is absolutely, it is absolutely necessary to know, to experience, to comprehend, to see the salvation of God. But I do not want us to lose sight that there is a perfect salvation that God desires to show us. That if we are in Christ, we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings. That we are not in an anticipation for more to come. We are in a continual expectation to behold the all that is come. The fullness that is present. The man who lives in us and is made unto us all that he is. And when we place the full weight of our salvation upon the premise of experience or comprehension, we are no better than those who are living from encounter to encounter or experience to experience, waiting on something to give them their little fix in order to solidify the soul's state. So we think experiences compiled upon one another bring about reality instead of that reality is already in us in its absolute fullness demanding the soul see and know. Because the reality we've come to is of such a nature that it is spirit and truth. We talked about it in the last class, these last Wednesday night class, that God demanded them to whom he gave the law not to put a form on it because he did not show them a form. He did not show them an image. He didn't show them a similitude when he gave them that law that testified of a perfect man. Because that perfect man and the life that that is a testimony of has no natural outward form must be revealed. Nothing of this creation, no supernatural, as we quote, unquote, say, event in this creation that can ever be observed with natural faculties will ever give a actual representation or evidence of the fullness that we have in Christ. 
The fullness that is the life of the Son living in us is only known when that Son who is life appears. But that life, we even before you see, is there. Whether you see or not. And he's there in all of his fullness. Because nothing other than him determines the state of the soul that he inhabits. If he inhabits that soul, he determines the state of that soul. And nothing else does. As the seed of death, the seed of Adam, death and sin was already realized in its fullest capacity. If the seed of God is in you, that is is your state to its fullest capacity. No gray areas. No maybes. But certainty. Certainty of state of being. Certainty of the presence of a life. So... Uh, this is what he's talking about. Being made free from sin, you become the servants to God or slaves to God. There is a sure basis for any pursuing of experience. Um, this is the uh, Weiss translation of this, uh, these verses in Romans 6. I'll read that before we go any further. Therefore, what fruit were you having then upon the basis of which things now you are ashamed? For the consummation of those things is death. But now having been set free, now we still always call it the evil nature, sin. Now having been free from the evil nature and having been made, been made bond slaves of God, you are having your fruit. Listen to these words, how it's worded. Having been made free from this, having been made free from sin. And Romans 7, Romans 7 is going to begin about the freedom of a wife from her husband. How does that happen? How is the, she freed from the law of her husband? And it's talking about the same thing here. He just goes on and describes it a little further there in the first part of chapter 7. But now he's saying, you have been freed from this. You have been set free, liberated from sin. Why? Because Christ is in you. And thus you have your fruit that results in holiness. What did you do to get that? Nothing. You did nothing to get it. The resulting of fruit the fruit that results in holiness, you already have it. Why? Because you have him who is the fruit of God. The increase of God. And what did you do for that to be true of you? You were born of his seed. I want us to see how certain this is. I want us to understand the certainty of our state because he is there. Because then <laughs> there is something absolute to call the soul to come and know and see. For the, uh, for the subsistence pay, this is the wages, which the evil nature doles out is death. But the free gift of God is life eternal in Christ our Lord. And the USB trans, uh, commentary says this about verse 23. He said, in, the, in a sense, this verse, verse 23, what we just read, is a conclusion to all that Paul has said throughout this chapter. He brings together two contrasts, the contrast between death and life, where he's already contrasted Adam and Christ in chapter 5, and between wages and the free gift. And you can't take those two things out of the context of the two men 
that he's contrasting as well. The man who lives in sin receives the wage of death. But the believer receives God's free gift, eternal life himself. Now, now we, the USB uh, New Testament handbook here says, the man who lives in sin receives what he has earned, death. And see, that is actually not the case. No more than you receive what you earn in Christ. You received the life of the seed that you were born of. And you could work and work and work, even with what Paul did in chapter 7, and he goes on and describes this. The man's working and working and working, trying to do what? Exactly what he says, trying to do the good. And that entails everything of the law. It entails every spiritual thing, righteousness, holiness, perfection, relationship with God. He's trying to do all of that. He's working and working and working. But what can he not overcome? The absence of the free gift. Because all of your zeal, all of efforts, when you're in this man, when you're in Adam, when you're not in Christ, all of your religious zeal, your efforts, all of your works, all of your, all of it, as committed to it as you could be, could never overcome the inward incapacity of man. It can never overcome the in, innate, I can say inbred because it's the seed, that, that incapacity that you have due to the seed of which you are born. You can't overcome that with zeal. You can't overcome that with observations. You can't overcome that. Paul was trying his best under the law to overcome who he actually was by birth. And the only thing that remedied the the division between those two things was a new birth, another life, the free gift of eternal life. Therein, the fruit that he was always trying to produce, yet was incapable of producing because of who he was. Because at all points he was contrary to the fruit he was trying to produce. Because the seed was not conducive to that fruit. You can't overcome who you are by what you do. You must be born again. And that's what we're talking about in Romans 7. Not a believer trying to do unsuccessively good things. We're talking about a man under the law, not born again. Having a testimony of a perfect life, but not having that perfect life. Trying to bear the fruit of that perfect life. And the sad thing is, is you still have believers today who have that perfect life and thus have that perfect fruit because that one who's in them is that perfect fruit because he is the life that in which that fruit is perfectly embodied. And they still are trying to produce fruit unto God. They're still trying to bring forth an increase that will please God. And the only increase that ever has pleased God is the life that he has bestowed to your soul. And here's the thing. Most are still after the wages instead of after the grace that has bestowed the free gift. Because we still want something of us in the picture. The grace of God has bestowed to the soul what you could never, ever attain, achieve, or produce. Now come and know this great gift. Come and see 
this man of perfect life and perfect righteousness who is in you. Do not put a false image on this that looks like yourself or that looks like a good version of you. There's another man. When you are born again, you receive the life of another man. You did not receive the potential to be like that man. Salvation is not potential. Salvation is the replacement of one man with another. Salvation is not to Adam. It is out from Adam into Christ. That's salvation. That's the deliverance that Paul will cry out for in Romans 7. Deliverance from a body or a man of death. What brings about that deliverance? Seeing Christ? No. Having Christ in you. That's the deliverance he receives. That is the new law that comes in with a person who is the substance of the law. Who is the one the law intended in its testimony. And when that life comes in you, guess what it does? It frees you from the law of sin and death that's in you because that's who you are by nature. That's who you were by natural birth. Another birth, another life. That's what we're seeing here. A transaction, a translation out from one into another. He's showing them the law, going to the law. He says it does the same thing in Galatians 3. In chapters 3, 4, and 5. When we're looking here at chapter 5, let me go ahead and read these verses. We're seeing the same thing he's saying here in Romans 6, 7, and 8. Especially Romans 7 and 8. Because you see Romans 7 as these works of the flesh, a man being faced constantly with his incapacity. A man being faced at all times, although desiring the fruit of a perfect life, being indwelt by an imperfect life, and thus incapable of bringing about such an end. And what we do in Christianity is we try to, we, we think we're supposed to fight that same battle. In fact, in the heading of my Bible, it says the Christian struggle in Romans 7. It is not the Christian struggle. That is not the struggle of a Christian. That is not the struggle of one in whom Christ lives. That's the struggle of one who is trying to be what he is not. A man who thinks he is something when he is nothing and he has deceived his own self. A man devoid of life, yet trying to produce the effects of life. There is a gift that has been bestowed that supersedes all of your zealous religious efforts. May we grow in that grace. The knowledge of the Lord himself. That's why we have the Spirit. Again, that contrast. So you see Romans 7, Romans 8, the same contrast is right here in Galatians 5. Galatians 5, starting in verse 17, for the flesh lusts against the Spirit. Listen to these words. Look at the contrariety that's described here, the enmity of this. He's going to talk about the enmity between flesh and Spirit in Romans 8. He's describing it here in Galatians. Again, The flesh, man, who I am, lusts against the spirit. One man lusts against another man. The spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other. And that doesn't change. The spirit of God in the soul is not there to finally tame the flesh. It is an altogether new life. When we're talking about flesh, we're not, just talk, we're not talking about this. We're not talking about my hand. We're talking about 
the sin and the death that governs me because of the seed of which I was born. That familiar thing that says, go after righteousness, pursue it, but not know him as. One is gained, one is grace. It's what Paul says, that which was gained to me, I pursued and achieved it and gained it. I accumulated it. It was of value to me because I worked for it. But you know what it was? What did Paul just say the wages of sin is? It was death. Looked like good. Looked like righteousness. According to your view. According to man's perspective, it was righteousness and holiness and everything. But according to God's perspective, when he finally opened the eyes of Paul, when Paul finally saw, he realized this is nothing but dung. This is nothing but death. There's nothing of value here. He saw it for what it was. It didn't become that. He saw it for what it always was. Because he saw the reality he was always trying to attain as another man. He saw another man as everything he was trying to become. So here we have the same contrast. The spirit against the flesh and these are contrary the one to the other. So you cannot do the things that you would. That's Romans 7. The good that I would do. How to perform it, I find not. Why? Because in me, in my flesh, there is no good thing. You see that? That's, that's the man of sin and death. Nothing good here. Therefore, you must be born again. Again, Paul's not a Christian here struggling He's a man devoid of life. Therefore devoid of all the absolute fullness that life brings about. And that life bestows. But if you are led by the Spirit, <coughs> you're not under the law. Oh, that's a wonderful statement. Most people don't understand it because we have our concept what it means to be led by the Spirit. See? Again, you have these two men, and if I took the time to draw it, you have these two men, you put a cross between it, you got Adam and you got Christ, you can have flesh and you can have spirit, all of the different terms that are used. If you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Romans 8, however, will say it this way, as many as are led by the spirit, they are the sons of God. Same things being said there. So what is being led by the Spirit? Because many people believe being led by the Spirit is what Paul's describing in Romans 7, basically. To do good things and to be holy and to be righteous. The word led there is very important. You can look it up in your Strong's. I think it's even in the Strong's it's said this way. Maybe in Vines it, it further elaborates on it. But it means to be led to the destination. To be led to the goal. To be led to the final place. Or the culminating place. It's not just being led. It's being brought to the goal of the thing. To the final, ultimate destination. How are you not under the law? Because you've allowed the Spirit to guide your soul to the end of that law. What is the end of that law? Well, it's perfect obedience. No, it's Christ himself. Galatians, again, go back there. Uh, he is, the law was until he came. And he was a schoolmaster to guide us where? Unto him. Wasn't to make us like him, it was to bring us to the goal of that testimony. 
That's why it was there. So that the seed could come. Bring us to the seed so we could be born of that seed. And born of that seed means receiving the life the law testified of but could not give. And therein, receiving that life, receiving the fruit. Having the fruit that that life truly is. So he gives all of these descriptions. He looks at, and I've looked at these before with you, uh, teaching uh, in some other uh, series of classes, but he's using a very vivid, he's using very vivid descriptive terms here to present the enmity between two men, two kinds, two seeds. This is not one man with two possible ways of conducting himself, evil or good. This is Paul presenting two men of, the two men of Romans. I'm speaking of in Galatians 5. By describing the makeup of these opposing seeds. And you have to keep in mind that Paul is attempting to demonstrate the foolishness of attempting to turn to the outward observation, to pr- outward observations of the law to produce a spiritual end. This is a continuation of his argument again in Galatians chapter 3 and Galatians 4. When he talks about those who are under the law, those who uh, uh, basically did not receive the end of the law in the person of the heir of the seed and those who have. And how have they and what is the seal of their sonship? The thing that the Jews believed they had by natural birth, they have received the spirit of adoption in their soul, crying, Abba, Father. So those who have come to him and received the life of that son, the heir of God himself being present. Now, how foolish it is to go back to law or go to the law the law that was insufficient to bring about any of that. To look for any of that. So I wrote this and, and, and uh, I want to read it. Because <clears throat> I think this brings the contrast again of Romans 5. What he's saying here at the end of, I mean Galatians 5, what he's saying here at the end of chapter 6 of Romans about the wages of sin and the gift of God being two men. And this very thing that he describes also in Galatians 3 and 4. I want you to see the similarity here. He's saying the same thing. He's contrasting the same thing. So I wrote here in in these verses that make up chapters 3 and 4 of Galatians, we're seeing Paul continue to make the same contrast as he had throughout this letter. We have to keep before us that he's making this contrast. And if this contrast between two does not guide us, then we can easily misunderstand his point and fail to realize the dramatic division that has taken place in Christ. First, we begin with Paul's statement, those under the law were under a schoolmaster until faith came. That's those continually working, trying to produce and trying to get the wages. And if the origin and source of that work is death, guess what the wages of that is going to be? Paul is obviously speaking of Christ as the faith That has come, and he is also showing that to receive this person of faith is the means of a sure deliverance from the bondage of law. Again, led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Paul is stating that Abraham's faith is totally fulfilled in the seed who is the embodiment of faith. 
The promise realized in a person. And to be born of the seed is to be partakers of the end of Abraham's faith. He, goes, he says that throughout. Which is the same as him writing this. In Christ we are blessed with faithful Abraham. That's what he says in Galatians. Those who are of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Blessed. In these shall all the nations be, so that those of faith are blessed with the faithful Abraham. He continues to declare the superseding nature of this seed and how he is the sufficient covenant of God that has been given. It then all comes down to this statement. If you are Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs in accordance to the promise. To further understand this, we have to see this in reference to the statement, not to seeds as of many, but to thy seed who is Christ. Now, I'm, I'm jumping a lot. I'm still in chapter 3 of Galatians, so follow me. Paul is showing here that these are partakers, these who are now partakers of the seed or in Christ, are partakers of the inheritance and Abraham's seed because they are in Christ, the seed of God. To, re to receive the intended fullness, we must receive it in and as the seed who is now come. So now we proceed into chapter 4. And unfortunately, these verses are not interpreted in reference to this continual contrast. So many, as once I did, believe that Paul continues the thought that is in the final verse of chapter 3, what we just read, heirs according to the promise. He continues that in chapter 4. And some think because of that, that Paul is now discussing the plight of those who are in Christ and who are heirs according to the promise, but who do not have yet sufficient understanding regarding that state. But this is not really the case. Paul is not stating that the believer, the heir, who are in Christ is under the schoolmaster of the law until they are mature. See that? It's not what he's saying. We still... We will see further down that the condition of a child is not remedied except in the coming of the Son. And that's about being under the law and being in Christ. Being a child or either being a son. That's being under the law or being in Christ. Paul is not continuing this argument about a believer being without understanding and thus under the law. He is demonstrating to those who are in Christ that they have received the thing that those under the law could never actually attain because it could only be received in the seed, who is one, not many. So to go to the law, he is saying, to find this inheritance that they've already received because they received it in the air himself is foolishness. For those under law are not, were not qualified Yet, for such a fullness. Qualified being in the Son, or born of the seed. And while under the law, those who were meant to be heirs, Romans 9 says that it was all intended for them. It all pertained unto them. And while those under the law were meant to be the heirs, they were incapable of receiving the intended inheritance until the seed or faith came. And they were still not capable to be recipients of the inheritance to be given in one seed while they were under the law. That is why Paul continues this by saying God sent forth his son into our heart crying out a father, to deliver those under the law. Then he brings this to the believer, having received the spirit who is in us, crying out a father, determining in us a relational fellowship of sonship because we are partakers of the son himself. 
Therefore, to look at the law to find the riches and the reality of the inheritance is futile and foolish. For it was never an issue of a lack of zeal or deeds. It was always a lack of son. The life. The seed. Just not being there. If they would receive him, they received everything they were intended for. But they had to receive it as him. See, this to me is the same thing he's saying throughout all of this. In Christ, we have received all things. Therefore, to look at anything less, to look at anything other than the sufficiency of the indwelling Christ is futile and it is ignorance. So the wages of sin, the continual working toward something in yourself is one way or receiving the gift. In this gift, all things are provided because in this gift, they are provided in one life. So I want to stop there. Uh, we just kind of went over some things, just threw a lot of information at you. But this is the life that God has bestowed. This is the riches and the fullness and the inheritance that has been bestowed. Why? Because he is in you. How? He is present. Nothing for you to do, no works for you to do, no zeal for you to bring about, no, nothing to accomplish. It is the gift of God. Lest any man should boast. Come and know this gift. Come and grow in this grace. We do not wait from a place of emptiness for reality. We wait in reality to behold the reality that's there. The fruitful one is present. He is the increase that glorifies his father. So. With that being said, we'll stop tonight. Appreciate you being with us. Hope this has helped. Until next time, amen.